we're dealing with the uh, detailed issue, the grounds of appeal, by referring the court to the remedy which the appellant seeks in the alternative. Uh, and begin by indicating the position of the respondents in relation to the remedy sought. Referring to core bundle, page 8. Yes. Points 1 to 4 of section 9 of the appellant's notice. Yes. Ask this court to replace the order made by His Honour Judge Hodge in the court below with its own order, which would effectively reverse the decision made at trial. Yes. Uh, I would make the uh, obvious point in relation to that. The judgment given by His Honour Judge Hodge Casey on the 26th of July last year pre presents a, we say, detailed, careful, and exhaustive analysis of the evidence and the law by an experienced Chancery judge. It's one which, in my respectful submission, should not be lightly interfered with by this court. It's a judgment delivered after the judge had heard the evidence over the course of um, five days. And the respondents will say that taking the points that arise on this appeal in the round, there is no proper basis for this court to substitute the order made by His Honour Judge Hodge KC with its own order. As to point five, at section nine of the appellant's notice, the notion that there should be a third trial to determine whether the 1986 or 2015 will should govern the administration of the modest estate of the late Anarea brings to mind the word used by Lord Denning when he was master of the rolls, albeit in a completely different context, but namely it would be, we say, an uh, quote, appalling vista. Um, if I may refer to core bundle page 93, paragraphs 75 to 80 of the respondent's skeleton for the appeal. Sorry, paragraphs? Uh, it is paragraphs 75 to 80. Thank you. Of the respondent's skeleton for the appeal, core bundle page 93. Yes. The Lord's Justices who ordered a retrial in 2002 were clear in the comments they made that they considered the notion of a second trial to be most unfortunate. That was the expression used by Lord Justice Snowden, paragraph 86. I'm not sure we have the transcript, but it was paragraph 86. And at paragraph 87, Lord Justice Lewison described the notion of a further trial as a, quote, tragedy for the whole family. Uh, but also now we have had that retrial with the appellant seemingly refusing to accept the determination of the court, having been uh, found by his honour Judge Hodge to be an untruthful witness, uh, and is before this court seeking in the alternative yet another trial, uh, in, in my submission that is a notion which the court should avoid at all costs, unless of course it concludes there is no alternative. In my submission, the evidence before the court should lead to the conclusion that it negates the need for a yet further trial, and that His Honour Judge Hodge's order made following the trial should stand. May I turn to the first pleaded ground of appeal, namely that it's the decision reached by His Honour Judge Hodge at trial was unjust because of serious procedural irregularity in the lower court, namely that in making his findings on undue influence, the judge relied on factors which were not pleaded in the particulars of undue influence at paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim. The appellant's case in response is as follows. Firstly, we say the defence and counterclaim adequately pleaded the respondent's case on undue influence and the pleadings were compliant with CPR 57.74. Secondly, that His Honour Judge Hodge, at paragraphs 125 to 132 of his uh, judgment, that's core bundle, pages 74 to 76, sufficiently relied 
on factors pleaded at paragraphs 13 and 14 of the defence and counterclaim to defeat the argument of ground one of the grounds of appeal that his decision was unjust because of a serious procedural irregularity. Uh, sorry, I didn't get all your paragraph numbers. The paragraphs of the judgment were... The paragraphs, my lord, were um, 125 to 132. And the paragraphs of the pleading were 13 and... 14. 14. Yeah. And thirdly, we say the appellant's skeleton in support of the appeal refers only to paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim. However, we say that in determining the undue influence issue his Honour Judge Hodge could also properly have regard to paragraph 40. Dealing with the pleadings which the judge had before him uh, at the trial, the particulars of the defence and counterclaim, they're at core bundle pages 98 to 100, uh, are signed by Amy, I think it's Byne or Dean, B-Y-N-E, who gives her position as a paralegal at SSB Law. Um, uh, that firm has been, I understand, in administration as from the 4th of January 2024. I believe it's unclear why the drafting of the pleadings in this case was uh, assigned to a paralegal rather than a solicitor. Uh, however, in my submission, that has no bearing or direct bearing on the issues in the appeal. Dealing with the pleadings in this case, pleading at paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim, core bundle page 98, is that the appellant, quotes, used her position, end of quote, to exert undue influence over the deceased and thereby put illegitimate pressure on her to execute the 2015 will. Under CPR 57.74, a party is required to give particulars of, quotes, facts and matters, end of quote, on which a party relies to support a contention of undue influence. Uh, in my submission, neither the rule itself nor the commentary in the White Book clarifies what is intended by the distinction in the rule between facts and matters and what might be a matter which would not qualify as a fact. In my position, the assertion in the instant case that the appellant used her position to exert undue influence over the deceased is an example of the particularization of a matter falling within CPR 57.74, which the respondents relied on to support the contention of undue influence. That was the primary matter, not fact, primary matter relied upon by the respondents, and which was the basis for the pleading of undue influence at paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim. Having particularised the primary matter relied upon, namely that the appellant used her position that illegitimate pressure on the deceased changed the terms of her will, the defence and counterclaim of paragraph 13 then gives particulars of several facts uh, which, which are pleaded in that paragraph and which facts support in my submission the primary matter pleaded that the uh, appellant used her position to exert proper pressure. Sorry, this is paragraph 40. Uh, this is paragraph uh, 13. 30. And 14 together. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the first limit of paragraph 13, right. which is core bundle page 98, uh, pleads as follows The claimant lived with the deceased and was involved in her care on a daily basis. By reason of old age, infirmity, and all vulnerability, the claimant relied on the. Uh, Says claimant there, but that may be a misspelling. No, no, I think the, no, the, the deceased, deceased relied, relied on the claimant yeah. for daily necessities and or to carry out basic tasks. That's the end of the pleading quote. Um, taking that paragraph as a whole, in my submission, 
any objective analysis of that paragraph would enable a judge properly directing himself to conclude that the facts being relied upon to support the primary allegation that the appellant had used her position to exert illegitimate pressure over the deceased were, firstly, at the time the undue influence is said to have been exerted by the appellant, the deceased was vulnerable by dint of old age and infirmity. Two, the deceased lived with the appellant, which fact afforded the appellant the opportunity to exert illegitimate pressure over the deceased. Three, the deceased was entirely reliant on the appellant for her daily needs, which fact again afforded an environment and the opportunity in which the deceased was exposed to illegitimate pressure. And fourthly, these facts taken together, namely the deceased's age and infirmity, that the appellant resided with her, and that the deceased was wholly dependent on the appellant for her daily needs, provided the collective factual basis for the primary allegation made at paragraph 13. In my submission, analysed in these terms, the pleading at paragraph 13 did sufficiently plead the respondent's case on undue influence. There were, there were I concede, there were other facts which might have been pleaded to support the primary allegation that the appellant had used her position to exert undue influence over the deceased. For example, by pleading that the defendants relied on the sudden and fundamental change in the deceased's testamentary intentions over a matter of days in November 2015, and that the deceased would not give her instructions to her solicitor without the appellant being present. However, in my submission, what was pleaded was sufficient to give a factual basis to the primary allegation. Had the further matters, such as the example, two examples I gave, had the further matters been pleaded, in my submission they would not have significantly altered the case which the appellant faced on undue influence. The appellant would still have had to deal with the same issues when giving her evidence under cross-examination as relevant to the issues, issue that she had used her position to bring illegitimate pressure on the deceased. Uh, as I said before, my lords, the, appellant, the appellant's skeleton for the appeal, I believe, refers only to the pleading of paragraph 13. However, in my submission, that paragraph has to be read together with paragraph 14. That's in the core bundle at page 99. And that pleads further matters that the defendants were relying upon. Namely, firstly, the appellant misrepresented her financial position and her ability to house herself uh, to the deceased. Uh, and we say this was a pleading of one of the factors relevant to the, def to the um, respondent's case on undue influence. And secondly, the appellant, the appellant misrepresented the proximity of the respondent's relationship to the deceased and their willingness to care for her. And we say these were further factors that His Honour Judge Hodge could properly have regard to in determining whether the respondents had made out their case on undue influence. So we say, in, in summary, that the pleadings were sufficient to give the factual building blocks to support the primary matter that had been pleaded, which was using the appellant using her position to exert illegitimate pressure on the deceased. Turning to the um, factors relied upon by His Honour Judge Hodge at paragraphs 125 to 132, 
two of the judgments, the core bundle pages 174 to 176, and the assertion that these went far beyond the particulars needed. At paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim, uh, I, I would respectfully refer the court to the respondent's skeleton for the purposes of this hearing at paragraph 48, which is in the core bundle at page 88. Looking at paragraph 125 of his judgment, uh, the learned judge refers to Anna's frailty and vulnerability. Paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim, core bundle page 98, expressly refers and pleads the deceased's vulnerability, her old age and infirmity. In my submission, it cannot be said that paragraph 125 of the judgment, in this case, relied in fact on factors which went, I quote, far beyond the particulars pleaded, as is asserted at paragraph 28 of the appellant's skeleton. Uh, paragraph 126 of the judgment refers to Anna's dependency on Rita. That is a matter expressly pleaded at paragraph 13 of the defence counterclaim. Um, as to paragraph 127, these are not matters specifically dealt with in the respondent's pleading. However, in my submission, they fall within the general tenor of the pleading at paragraph 14 of the defence and counterclaim that the appellant made misrepresentation and was not candid when it came to the circumstances in which the will was changed in 2015. And it is to be noted that at paragraph 127, His Honour Judge Hodge comments, I quote, I accept Mr. Witt's submission that Rita's evidence that she was unaware of the other changes that her mother, her best friend, was proposing to make to her will until the meeting with Mrs. Sakul on the 17th of November is lacking in all credibility and that it is inconceivable that Anna and Rita would not have discussed the proposed changes to Anna's previous will in the two or three week interval after Rita claims that this was first raised at the beginning of November. End of quote. And in my submission, this is in effect his honour Judge Hodge making a finding that the appellant tends to misrepresent matters, which is precisely what paragraph 14 of the defence uh, and counterclaim pleads. Turning to paragraph 128, which refers to the timing of the new will, this is not specifically pleaded in the defence and counterclaim, either of paragraphs 13 or 14. However, in my submission, the respondent's statement of the case, having pleaded both matters within CPR 57.74 and facts within CPR 57.74, uh, relied upon in support of the contention of undue influence. In my submission, in setting out his reasons for finding that undue influence had been made out on the facts, His Honour Judge Hodge was entitled, as part of his judicial function, to have regard to other items of evidence, even if not specifically uh, pleaded by the respondent. Uh, and that this is the correct approach, in my submission, is further support, supported by those authorities, which I'll come to briefly, on which the, in which the courts have made clear that the existence of undue influence may be inferred from all the evidence available to a judge at, at trial. And just to uh, emphasise the point I'm seeking to make, my lords, if one looks at CPR 57.74, the phrase used is facts and matters, but no other no other phrase connected to that. There doesn't have to be full facts and full particulars. The idea in my submission of CPR 57.74 is to 
and show that on sufficient facts and matters are pleaded that the, the, the party against whom those facts and matters are pleaded knows the case that they have to meet. It's not necessary to plead in my submission every conceivable point or every conceivable piece of evidence or something that may arise in the course of the trial uh, at the point of pleading. I haven't looked up 57.7 uh, um, just now, but um, it can't be intending to say um, if you've got 10 facts you rely on, it's good enough to plead two. Yes, I mean, the, 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 uh, I will come to some relevant authority, but I, I believe the, the litmus test in my respectful submission is whether one can look at a set of pleadings and objectively ask, would those pleadings enable the party whom they are pleaded against to know the case they were facing? And I know you're going to come to the authorities, but does that do justice to Lord Millet's two limbs? One limb is the other side need to know what yes. the case is. And the other is, he says, well, aside from that, um, if you don't things that uh, um, uh, in that case fraud that uh, uh, make out the case of fraud well yes. we'll take it there is no clear yes. fraud uh, in relation to that which I, I will come to I believe that is a, a, a particular issue which is relevant to fraud but undue influence can arise without any fraud being present at all someone can be guilty of undue influence without meaning to exert undue it may be their natural personality, which, without knowing it, dominated the deceit. So in, I, I will submit that fraud, which requires the highest level of pleading, falls to be distinguished from civil undue influence, uh, such as one had in this case. And the stringent standards that you might expect of fraud do not necessarily follow and apply in the context of undue influence. Um, uh, going back to the uh, uh, factors or the findings of the judge, paragraph 129 of the judgment. His Honour Judge Hodge refers to the appellant having made the arrangements for the deceased to see the solicitor and the deceased having insisted that the appellant be present at meetings with the solicitor. Uh, in my respectful submission, the court may regard this as being encompassed by the pleading of the matters that the appellant used her position to exert undue influence over the deceased. Part of using her position as pleaded was to make sure that she controlled things such as how the meetings with the solicitor proceeded. Um, by dint of her position as the principal carer for the deceased, who was aged and infirm at the relevant time, by dint of living with the deceased, she was able to exert control over the mechanics for the making of the 2015 will uh, and seek to control, as I say, the manner in which meetings with the solicitor uh, occurred and took place. Uh, and in my submission, it was entirely proper in his judicial function uh, of determining, do I probably have a case of undue influence before me? In, in, in determining that question, um, Judge Hodge was, in my, his honour Judge Hodge was, in my submission, entitled to have regard to the evidence about the control that was exerted at meetings, which was part of the collectivity of the matters and the facts from which he would make um, a finding. Paragraph 130 of uh, his judgment. His Honour Judge Hodge refers to the terms of the will, in particular Clause 11, finding the words of that clause would not have been used by the deceased and was a case of the deceased speaking through the appellant. In my submission, the court may take a broad view of this and find that it falls within the pleading of paragraph 14 that the appellant misrepresented matters for her advantage 
in respect of the deceased's will. And finally, paragraph 131. The respondent's case is that this uh, part of the judgment is expressly covered by the pleading at paragraph 14. That, that quotes, the claimant misrepresented her financial condition and her ability to um, house herself. So we say that all of the factors that were set out by His Honour Judge Hodge in support of his finding that the 2015 will was the product of undue influence are within the ambit of the pleadings in this case, or if they were not specifically pleaded, are matters of evidence which the learned judge could properly have regard to in reaching his finding on um, undue influence. I, I, just for completeness, I'm not sure you dealt with one paragraph 132, did you? I'm sorry, another word. I, I, I'm not sure you dealt with paragraph 132 of the judgment. I want to. The judge is a yes. factor. Yes, I may, I may have missed that. Uh, now I just briefly refer to that. Yes, uh, 132, which is the, 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 the failure of uh, the deceased or the appellant to disclose the evidence um, uh, about the changes to the will, even though there was the opportunity. Once again, I would simply say I believe that falls within... The, the judge had before him the witness statement. He'd heard the oral evidence. In my submission, that is part of the evidence he could validly have regard to, provided that what was pleaded was sufficient to give a, an evidential basis for the undue influence question to be considered. Uh, I deal with it in, in, the, in ground one of the um, skeleton argument, um, as I read it, uh, does not attack the pleadings as such. It appears to attack the judge's treatment of those pleadings and the fact that he, he stepped where the allegation is assertion is that he stepped outside those pleadings in making his finding. Whereas in the skeleton argument, both the skeleton argument in support of the appeal and in the supplementary skeleton, uh, the, the ground of dispute shifts somewhat because there are attacks on the pleadings themselves, not simply the judge's handling of the pleadings he had before him. Um, May I just, on the point about the mandatory requirements of CPR 57.74, uh, and refer to two cases, and the reason I would refer to these authorities, they support, I seek to rely on these authorities in support of the assertion that CPR 57.74 does not require a pleader at the point of pleading to plead every conceivable point that a judge may subsequently rely on as part of the evidence at trial. Um, authorities bundle page 229. This is uh, British Airways Pension Trustees versus Sir Robert uh, McAlpine and Sons. Uh, and, and the paragraph we on relied on hopefully was marked out. This is um, Lord Justice Savile in that case saying, uh, I quote, the basic purpose of Sorry, hold on. is to enable the... Sorry, when, hold on. Can you give me the page reference yes. again? Authorities bundle 229. 229, thank that. you. Yes. Lord Justice Savile, British Airways Pension Trustees case, uh, I quote, the basic purpose of pleadings is to enable the opposing party to know what case is being made in sufficient detail to enable that party properly to prepare to answer it. 
To my mind, it seems that in recent years there's been a tendency to forget this basic purpose and to seek particularization even when it's not really required. This is not only costly in itself, it's calculated to lead to delay and to interlocutory battles in which the parties in the court pour over endless pages of pleading to see whether or not some particular point has or has not been raised or answered, when in truth each party knows perfectly well what case is made by the other and is able properly to prepare to deal with it. Um, I appreciate, my lords, this is not a case where the pleadings are particularly complex. However, in my submission, the basic point made by Lord Justice Savile in that case is equally applicable in the instant case. I might say, but I, I remember when I, I was at the bar, I was very keen on the next sentence. Oh. I, I didn't know the Pleadings are not a game to be played at the expense of litigation. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. So just bear with me. Don't worry. wishing to labour the point, but um, I also refer to uh, Authorities Bundle, page 201. These are the observations of Lord Wolf, Master of the Rose, in Macphillamy and Times newspapers. Uh, again, I hope it's, it's, it's outlined. Quotes, the need for extensive pleading, including particulars, should be reduced by the requirement of witness statements now exchange. In the majority of proceedings, identify, identification of the document upon which a party relies, together with copies of that party's witness statement, will make the detail of the nature of the case the other side has to meet obvious. This reduces the need for particulars in order to avoid being taken by surprise. This does not mean that pleadings are now superfluous. Pleadings are still required to mark out the parameters of the case that is being advanced by each party. In particular, they are still critical to identify the issues and the extent of the dispute between the parties. And then I emphasize these words, my lords. What is important is that the pleading should make clear the general nature of the case of the pleader. And he says, this is true under both the old rule and the new rule, um, which in, in my submission is an indication that the new CPR rules are subject to the same interpretation. Uh, in my submission, leaving aside the technical point that non-compliance with CPR 57.74 does not form part of ground one of the appellant's grounds of appeal, we say the pleadings of paragraphs 13 and 14 of the defence and counterclaim in this case were CPR compliant containing as they did particulars of both matters and fact relied on in support of the contention of undue influence. Uh, and that there was nothing improper, let alone procedurally irregular, in the judge saying, well, I see the points that are pleaded. I've been listening to this case now for five days. I've read the witness statements. I've heard the oral evidence of the witnesses. Uh, and I believe there are other facts which add to the building block. And in my submission, it's not an irregularity. And it didn't lead to any unjustness uh, in the outcome, in my submission. My Lords, there was a point raised this morning about the failure to seek strike uh, or, or, or to, ha to take some action prior to the trial to flag up this supposed issue of the material scope of the pleadings. Um, and, and in my submission, even if the court were to conclude that the pleadings at paragraphs 13 and 14 of the defence and counterclaim were not CPR compliant. Nevertheless, the court should dismiss 
grant one of the appeal because of the appellant's failure to take the necessary steps to challenge the proceeding, the uh, pleading, sorry, prior to um, trial. Uh, if I may refer to um, paragraph five of the respondent's skeleton, at core bundle page 84. This refers to the Law Society Contentious Probate Handbook, paragraph 8.81. My Lord, it appears there is no electronic version anywhere of the Law Society Contentious Probate Handbook. It's only available in hard copy form. So it, the point that's made or, or quoted from the handbook is not contentious in my submission. It says that the provisions of the CPR providing for strikeout or summary judgment in respect of the whole or part of a claim, also apply to probate claims. So if there was an issue that the pleadings were non-compliant, strikeout was a possibility. And if, as the appellant now claims, uh, the respondent's pleadings on undue influence were not CPR compliant, it was open to the appellant to make an application to strike out or summary judgment, at least of that part of the claim which asserted undue influence, no such application was made, and nor is there any explanation for this. And if one goes to the transcript of the hearing, that's in the supplementary bundle, page 576. It's page 544. Sorry, can you say that again? Yes. It's a supplementary bundle, page 576. You're going to the end of the case. I'm sorry? You're you're taking us to the yes, transcript. Yes, it's part of the closing submission. I mean, in one sense, I wonder whether the story does start earlier, because, yes. um, uh, contrary, I think Mr. Deacon says to an agreement, you did briefly open the case. Yes, I will come to that. I see, okay. That, yes. But it's part of the explanation about the, the, the strike up. Yeah. Uh, so it's five. Supplementary bundle 576, page 544 of the transcript. In the course of its closing submission, uh, Mr. Deacon, he says, um, just leading up to this, he says, quotes, the pleading simply does not set out a coherent case. But even at that stage, there's no submission that the pleadings of undue influence were not CPR compliant. And then at supplementary bundle page 582, this is page 550H of the uh, transcript. Mr. Deacon submits, I quote, But can I just say, my lord, the one, I mean, one of the difficulties with the case, if not the, the actual particulars are not nailed down as they, I do not want to keep harping on about it, but it does make it very difficult to see where the true focus is. And one has to, you know, with any trial, keep it within reasonable bounds. End of quote. And um, <coughs> my submission, even being charitable, yeah, well, you might like the bit at the top of the next page as well, yes. where Mr. Deacon says that had he been involved earlier, yes. uh, an application strikeout would have been justified. Yes. And he then says, now I have not pursued it. Yes, yes, I was coming to that. Now I have not pursued it. And then his honour Judge Hodge goes on to say, well, I strongly suspect that any application to strikeout would have been unsuccessful given the history of this. And Mr. Deacon says, I agree. So there is Mr. Deacon... Uh, in my submission, admitting a strikeout application could have been made, admitting that it hadn't been made, not providing an explanation for why it hadn't been made, but then agreeing with his honour Judge Hodge that had it been made, it would have been unsuccessful in any of it. Um, so we say that the, the appellant, having failed to avail itself of an, an, of an accepted procedure, to attack the case of undue influence by means of an application to strike that part of the respondent's case or by means of an application for summary judgment. It's, it's, it is improper, we say, following the failure to prove the 2015 will at trial for the appellant to ask this court to revisit the question whether undue influence should ever be before the judge. And um, aside from strikeout, there were other actions that could have been taken. Um, 
um, I'm not sure it's in the bundle, but the Chancery Guide 2022 provides for uh, relatively short questions of law to be tried as preliminary matters. And you will hear there was a question of law. Do we have pleadings with, which are CPR 57.74 compliant? That could easily have been dealt with in my search uh, as a preliminary matter before trial. And then um, coming to the point which my Lord made, um, uh, if we refer to the transcript of the hearing, this is going back to the start of the trial. It's in a supplementary bundle, page 38, page 6, paragraph G of the, of the transcript. Mr. Deacon says he is not proposing to open unless there are particular matters the learned judge wants him to deal with. Uh, of course, I don't imply any criticism of my learned friend. However, in my submission, if, as is now asserted, the particulars relating to undue influence were grossly insufficient, that is how it's put in the appellant skeleton, it, it, it would have been reasonable to expect that matter to be addressed in the opening for the appellant. And then at supplementary bundle page, um, I've got it as page 28, paragraph 6H, Mr. Deacon says, I quote, I'm just going to get straight into the evidence. End of quote. Sorry, where are you? I, I've got it down, my lord, as a supplementary bundle page 28, but I think that may be 38. Paragraph 6H. It is the page we're on. Oh, yes, I see. This yes. is the bottom of yes. that page. Yeah. Um, and then at, at the supplementary bundle, page 39, paragraphs 7, 8, C, Mr. Deacon raises one issue about testamentary capacity, but again, no issue is raised about undue influence or the pleading. Um, supplementary bundle, page 46, paragraph 14, C, Page 14C, sorry, of the transcript. His Honour Judge Hodge asks me if there is anything I want to say in opening, or would I prefer straight, go straight to the evidence? I then start opening submissions at page 14H. Supplementary bundle, page 48, page 16C of the transcript. I submitted to the court, I quote, the defendant's case is that Anazar Walt Fass, in November 2015, was a result of influence exercised by Rita, that's the appellant, which the law considers to be undue, and which enables this court to interfere and prove against the admission of the 2015 will to probate. End of quote. I'm sorry, I've lost you. Oh, I see, yes, I've caught up with you. Yeah. Uh, and at the same page in the transcript, uh, paragraphs B to H, so page 16, D to H. I refer, referred in opening to the evidential factors relevant to undue influence, and at paragraphs G to H, I referred specifically to issues of frailty and vulnerability, which, uh, as we see, my Lord, were specifically pleaded in the defence and counterclaim. Supplementary bundle, page 49, transcript page 17c I refer to undue influence again and then at supplementary bundle page 50 that's page 18c of the transcript is after hearing my submissions or receiving my submissions on undue influence Mr. Hodge uh, sorry his honour Judge Hodge says to my learned friend quote did you want to say anything in response to that Mr. Deacon and Mr. Deacon's reply is, quote, no, I do not. Um, and in my submission, if, as is now claimed, the particulars of undue influence were grossly insufficient, that invitation from his honour Judge Hodge, is there anything you want to say in response to the submissions on undue influence, that was the opportunity writ large for my learned friend to raise that issue with the court, but no mention whatever is made of it. So we say... Um, uh, my lords, even if there is an issue, or was an issue, 
on the adequacy, adequacy of the respondent's pleading of undue influence, in particular whether the pleadings were CPR compliant. We say that as opportunity after opportunity to raise that issue either before the trial or at the trial or in the opening submissions or closing submissions was not taken, we say it now ill behoves the appellant to seek to reopen that question uh, before this court uh, and that ground one of the appeal should be dismissed. Turning to um, uh, ground two, if I may, this asserts the judge was wrong to have found an undue influence when, firstly, there was no direct evidence of undue influence, uh, and secondly, there were no facts which undue influence could be inferred. If I could deal with the second point first, no facts from which undue influence could be inferred, I refer to my submissions already made the paragraphs 13 and 14 of the defence and counterclaim plead both matters within CPR 57.74 and facts within 57.74 so that the contention that there were no facts and that is the contention not that the facts that were set out were insufficient but there were no facts that, that in my submission flies in the face of the content of the pleadings. As to the second matter of ground two, no direct evidence of undue influence. The uh, appellant's skeleton doesn't seek to define what is meant by the phrase direct evidence. But at core bundle 25, which is paragraph 36 of the uh, appellant's skeleton, References made to Caswell and Pohl Dufferin Associated Corries Limited, distinguishing inference based on proven objective facts, to be contrasted with mere speculation or conjecture. And the respondents say in this case, His Honour Judge Hodge based his finding at paragraphs 127 to 132 of his judgment on historically verifiable facts rather than speculation or con conjecture. If we take the judgment at paragraphs 125 to 132, core bundle pages 74 to 76, uh, and the fact is listed by his Honour Judge Hodge in support of his finding of his Honour these factors are based on historically verifiable or otherwise verifiable medical evidence. They were not simply based on conjecture or speculation with no factual or evidential basis whatsoever. That clearly was not the case. Please. As to the complaint of ground two that there was no direct evidence of undue influence, in my respectful submission, that may be considered a non-point in support of the appeal in the sense that there are numerous statements from the courts that a finding of undue influence does not need to be based on direct evidence. And if I could refer to the authorities bundle page 157. This is uh, the authority Schomburg and Taylor. Paragraph 30 of the judgment of Mark Dawson sitting as a deputy judge at the High Court, now his honour judge, of course, KC. Um, Sorry, what was the page again? Uh, the page is uh, Authorities Bundle 157. Thank you. Paragraph 30 in Schomburg and Taylor. Would your, would your lordships wish me to read that paragraph? Or? Yeah, we can read it to ourselves.
Yes. And I ought to emphasize the last three lines of that citation where Judge Corson says, quotes, this last case also makes clear that a finding of undue influence can be made by a court drawing inference from all the circumstances, even in the absence of direct evidence of undue influence. And also authorities bundle page 224. Schrader and Schrader, High Court, Mr. Justice Mann, paragraph 96. Sorry, say that again, which page? Yes, it is, my Lord, uh, Authorities Bundle 224. Thank you. Schrader and Schrader, paragraph 96, where the learned judge said, I quote, it will be a common feature of a large number of undue influence cases but there is no direct evidence of the application of influence. It is of the nature of undue influence that it goes on when no one is looking. That does not stop it be, stop its being proved. The proof has to come, if at all, from more circumstantial evidence. The present case has those characteristics. The allegation is a serious one, so the evidence necessary to make out the case has to be commensurately stronger on uh, normal principles. Uh, and finally, uh, my Lord's Authorities Bundle, page 180. This is Theobald on Wills, 19th edition, paragraph 4060. Quote from the learned editors. Quote, that is not, however, to say that undue influence cannot be inferred from circumstantial evidence. Um, indeed, direct evidence is rare, as coercion will usually occur behind closed doors. End of quote. As to the appellant's skeleton, paragraph 38, core bundle, page 25, I quote, Even taken cumulatively, the listed factors are not consistent and only consistent with a hypothesis of undue influence. Um, as to that, at par par paragraph 123 of his judgment, that's the core bundle, the top of page 74, uh, core bundle, top of page 74, the learned judge directed himself as follows, quote, I recognize, however, that one can never know with absolute certainty what went on behind closed doors. Nevertheless, it is not enough to prove that the facts are consistent with the hypothesis of undue influence. What must be shown is that the facts are inconsistent with any other hypothesis. And at paragraph 124, on the same page, he commented, I quote, nevertheless, I am satisfied that the facts are consistent only with Rita, that is the appellant, having procured the making and execution of the 2015 will by the exercise of undue influence over her mother, which overpowered Anna's volition without convincing her judgment. And in from, my from those two paragraphs, sorry, go on. No, go on. Finish but, your... uh, I, I was going to submit, my lord, that. Um, Paragraphs 123 and 124 of the judgment of his honour, Judge Hodge, um, cannot be faulted in the approach to the test for undue influence. He, he directs himself correctly. And indeed, one might say that those paragraphs are a paradigm of how a judge should approach the question of undue influence. And uh, without prejudice to that point, the judge deals absolutely correctly with the issue. Uh, it is arguable the appellant puts the case as to what has to be proved for a finding of undue influence too highly. We were referred to this in the morning session. It's the authorities bundle, page 180, Theobald 4060. Where the learned commentators, the most authoritative text, 
uh, Craig Rothman said it must be shown that the circumstances attending the, the execution must be inconsistent with any hypothesis other than its having been procured by undue influence. But this is overstating the position. The standard of proof is the balance of probabilities. Certainly, it's not enough to show merely that the facts are consistent with undue influence or that there was an opportunity to exercise undue influence. But the true test is whether undue influence is the most likely hypothesis having regard to the inherent unlikelihood of someone practicing undue influence or on a testator. And that is precisely the question which the learned judge asked himself. Is undue influence probably the explanation in this case? Is the evidence in the round, as he said at the paragraph 133, looking at the, the whole of the evidence, is it strong enough to justify a finding of undue influence? And in my submission, the judge could not have been clearer that that was his conclusion. Uh, and a, la a, a feature of his coming to that conclusion was that having listened carefully to the evidence over the course of five days, his conclusion was the appellant was not being truthful in uh, evidence. And, and the judge, of course, had had the benefit of listening to the evidence or of witnessing the witness, as it were, in, in, in her responses uh, to questions. And, and one would struggle in my submission to um, find a valid basis on which to attack this very carefully considered uh, judgment. Okay. Can I sort of jump to the end of my yeah. um, Can I compare an alternative hypothesis? Yes. Because you know, one has to look at the alternatives. So one of the alternative hypotheses put by Mr. Deacon is um, the mother perceives, rightly or wrongly, that she's been abandoned by her son. Yes. And she uh, is very grateful to her daughter for all the help that her daughter is giving. Um, conceivably, the daughter encourages her to think about revisiting her will. But persuasion of itself is not undue influence. And we'll suppose, for the sake of this argument, that the mother's persuaded, she goes to the solicitor, she says, I want to change my will. Yeah. And she does so. Um, so let's just consider whether the evidence is consistent with that hypothesis. Is it? Is there anything yes. that the judge draws attention to that would be inconsistent with that hypothesis? In my response to submission, that, that would fall within the example given by, or the, or the view expressed in Theobald, Seeking to exclude any explanation other than undue influence is putting the test too high. Almost every fact which might support undue influence could also have an innocent explanation. Unless, and all of the judges, I mean the judges in, in, in numerous cases have made the comment, undue influence goes on behind closed doors. The fact that there might possibly be an innocent explanation in my submission, doesn't disqualify a judge from saying, in exercising my judicial function, my experience in listening to witnesses, assessing witnesses, testing their evidence, allows me to find that the most likely explanation is that this was a case of undue influence, because undue influence goes on behind closed doors. The only example where one might have direct evidence is if one had a witness who saw the deceased being beaten with a belt and being told, change the will, or I will, I will hit you, or something of that nature. I see that. Um, but on the other hand, plainly the mere fact that something could have gone on behind yes. closed doors doesn't mean it did go on behind closed yes. doors. One has to find more than that. Yes. So can we just come back a moment to the hypothesis, which is, we'll suppose that um, the mother thought her sons had abandoned her, was grateful yes. to her daughter, possibly with persuasion from her daughter, decides she wants to yes. change the will in her daughter's favour. Now, is there anything in any of the factors that the judge draws attention to? Yes. Well, let's take it individually, first of all, which okay. would be inconsistent with that hypothesis. Yes, I, I believe there is, my lord. For example, I, I can go to the specific paragraph, but that part of the judgment where he says there is simply no plausible explanation for the terms of the will not having been discussed 
with the brothers who were being excluded, or there is no plausible explanation for the appellant to have contended that between November, early November, I think it was the 8th of November, 2015, when the deceased first mentioned, I want to change my will, I want to be cremated, and the meeting with the solicitor, uh, the appellant's evidence was there was absolutely no communication between us about the will. And the judge considered that, and he found it incredulous that the appellant was living on a daily basis with the deceased having been informed that she wanted to change the will, he found it incredulous that there would have been absolutely no discussion about the terms of the will. And in my submission, that was a, 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 a determination he was, he was properly uh, enabled to make. And of course, he had had the benefit of seeing the appellant in the witness box. Uh, and as the person who cross-examined the appellant in the witness box, it would have been apparent to anyone that she was very forceful, she was very defensive, she was very argumentative. It may not uh, appear from the transcript, but one could hardly ask a question without some form of defensive uh, attack. Uh, and that was all part of the judge's careful reasoning on putting different factors into the scale. Did they tilt in favor of undue influence? Uh, and it was clearly his decision that he did. As, uh, as his honor Judge, jo uh, Judge Hodge candidly said, we really will never know what went in most cases, we will never know what went on. But it's taking a common sense view of the evidence and asking what what probably happened here. And we had a very experienced chancery judge considering this question. Not a guarantee that it was right, but in terms of did he approach the question he had to determine correctly, considering the relevant factors, considering the evidence, in my submission, uh, he did. And, and the way he approached the case is consistent with the manner in which, for example, Mr. Justice Mann approached the same issue in... in, in and I can see the way that these paragraphs in the judge's judgment resemble somewhat the sub-paragraphs yes. of Mr. Justice Mann's judgment. Yes. Um, just, I, I see the point about uh, the judge's assessment of uh, the appellant's personality. Just picking up your other point, um, you say, well, there's no plausible explanation of, uh, is, is it really your clients not having been told afterwards about what was in the will? Yes. Well, let's come back to my hypothesis yes. to test it again. So we suppose for the sake of argument that uh, the appellant has had a hand in persuading her mother to yes. cut her brothers out of the will. Yes. That's legitimate. Yes. That of itself, persuasion is fine. Um, why does the fact that the will wasn't something that her brothers were told about tend one way or the other on the question of whether there was undue influence? Why, why would that be more probable with undue influence than it would be with the appellant having persuaded her mother to change the will? Because I believe, uh, my lord, that his honour, Judge Hodge, when considering that question, had heard evidence by that stage that Anna was a kind, sweet, lady with a charitable uh, personality. And he was ha asking himself, is it, is, it, is it conceivable that she would have, after, after a settled testamentary intent of 30 years, is it conceivable that she would have completely eliminated her sons from the will uh, and made no mention of that? Now, it could be that there was an innocent explanation, it, you know, that she was... Uh, ashamed to tell them. But the judge also considered that. He'd had evidence that she was sweet child, but also forceful. She had her own mind. It, to the judge assessing the evidence, it's more likely that that indicates something was amiss, namely undue influence, rather than an entirely innocent explanation. And one could go through each point of the factors and ask the question, is there an alternative innocent explanation? But it's the my submission, the collective nature of the evidence, uh, as my, my Lord said this morning, the, I think it was the one string in a rope by itself may indicate nothing. But by the time you get to eight strands, uh, it's a very different uh, 
question. Uh, and I do uh, endorse to the core the approach which is set out in, in Theobald, which is that seeking to eliminate every innocent explanation would put a very, very, almost an impossible burden on anyone trying to establish undue influence. The general test, the balance of probability, or be it keeping in mind that in a case of undue influence it must be a, a strict test, is, is this the correct approach? And um, that is, in my submission, the approach that John and Judge Hodge followed. I, mean, I quite follow your argument that the judge can't be faulted in his assessment of the legal principles. The fact remains uh, that coercion is a very serious thing. Yes. Probably for that reason it's hardly ever proved. Yes. Um, My, my, well, I, Mr. Deacon does say, well, these, all these factors put together just can't prove that very serious thing. In my respect for submission, they... They do. They do. <laughs> uh, or are capable of doing. Are capable yes. of doing. It is the distinction between the search for what really happened in this case, which in, in my submission is an impossible search, from taking the various elements, if you piece them together uh, and make the jigsaw, uh, what is the most probable explanation? Uh, and one must not forget the judge had before him a lady who had a settled testamentary intention for 30 years, and that had evaporated, literally in the space of a few days, uh, in November 2015. There had to be, an, the, the appellant had the opportunity in the witness box to explain that. That was her opportunity to persuade the judge that this was all innocent. Uh, and it's quite clear from what the judge said that he considered she was not being truthful. Uh, when you have a witness who is not being truthful, that adds to the question mark uh, and is something that is going to tip the balance in favour of a finding of undue influence. In the to what extent when a judge is testing whether the facts are, I mean, this is how he puts it in paragraph 123, are inconsistent with any other hypothesis, and I understand your submission. Does he have to do that? Because the judge in 124 simply states it. To what extent does one need to see in judgment a balancing of the factors, the evidence, to show that the judge has had in mind yes. fact, facts or factors yes. which point in a different direction? Yes, I understand the point. In this case, my submission, that is what His Honour Judge Hodge was doing. He didn't on each point expressly say, I am balancing whether there is a guilty or innocent explanation. He didn't say that in express terms. But in his deliberations, he would have considered, is this an innocent or a guilty explanation? Uh, and in the eight, on those eight points, he had come to the conclusion that they tended to show or indicated a guilty explanation, especially when you, you took them together. But the mere fact that he wasn't expressly referring to a balancing exercise, uh, in my submission, should not be taken as necessarily indicating that he didn't carry out a balancing and exercise. And certainly in at least one case, as we've already discussed, paragraph 1 through 2, he expressly does consider it because he was yes. cites. Yes. And he asked um, um, Rita... Uh, whether Anna had ever said yes. she was concerned it might cause a row, yes. which would be the obvious innocent explanation. Yes. So he certainly yes. had that point in mind. Yes. One can see that. Yes. Uh, and this was, of course, a, what a very experienced Chancery judge who would have known his task and his function in deciding the undue influence. One of the main, as I understand it from the papers, thrusts of your case below who was, was that uh, the deceased mind had been poisoned. Uh, by that, that was not. That was not. Uh, uh, I'm trying to recall. <laughs> <laughs> that was not so much a feature of the second trial. I don't believe. I think the the main thrust of the second trial was that the appellant was, as the judge found, a very domineering figure. There was clearly an element of dependency and frailty, and the sense was that when faced with request to pressure from the appellant to change her will in a manner that favoured the appellant, 
well, as is said in the case of Edwards, when someone is old and frail, they just sometimes don't have the will to withstand that, that sort of passion. All the opportunity was there, uh, and there was really no explanation or credible explanation as to why that will had so suddenly changed, as to why it wasn't discussed, as to why it was concealed from the respondents until the deceased had passed away. There were no explanations which the judge could look to and say, oh yes, that explains all of this chronology. Well, what about paragraph 119, when the judge finds that Anna's assessment yeah. that she had been abandoned was an assessment that was open to her as a matter of historical fact? Now that's, you might think, yes. quite a powerful contrary uh -huh. indication, because it gives uh, a clear reason for the change of the will, and indeed, as I think I'm yes. right in saying, it was the reason yes. that was given by the deceased to the solicitor yes. and to the doctor. Yes, that is indeed the basis of the finding. Yeah, I suppose it, I mean, it was open to Anna. But that's an explanation, but you said there was no other explanation for the well, change the, of the will. Well, the judge found there was no other explanation. Well, where, this is an explanation. Um, where does the judge deal with that as a possible ex explanation for change of mind or the change of the will? Well, I think the judge was finding that it, whatever the deceased thought or considered about the conduct of David and Nina uh, and what was apparent, an uh, important aspect of the trial was that if Anna had made that it would not have had a basis in historical fact. The evidence showed that until a matter of days before she died, she was receiving visits and care from David and Nina. So I, I, I appreciate it looks as though the judge is saying there could have been an innocent explanation, but a strong part of the, the evidence was that if she had come to that conclusion, there wasn't a basis in fact. For well, I'm sorry, but he says the opposite. He says there was an assessment that was open yes. to her. So I, I see how he says it there. But <laughs> and d does he factor that in anywhere into his analysis of whether the facts are consistent with uh, another a, a, a hypothesis other than coercion? Well, I think he's when one takes the facts as a whole, balances them. Even if Anna had thought my sons ha haven't been caring for me, even if that was her subjective assessment. It still didn't explain what he saw as a profound turnaround in her testamentary intention. And talking about balancing of the evidence, where does he, in his factors that lead him to the conclusion, balance the evidence from the solicitor and the doctor? Yes, I, I can deal with that in, in a right. Side by so it's. It... Should I deal with the ground? Do, do. Yes. yes. Which really takes us to ground three that I will deal with that. Um, um, the ground three is slightly different because ground yes. three is saying uh, almost a matter of law, but this is the judge's analysis yes. that leads him, or by which he expresses his conclusion yes. that the deceased uh, will was overborne. Yes. Right. Thank you. Sorry, I lost the question. No, it, uh, <laughs> that's the context of this. Yes. It's where, how and where do we see the judge balancing yes. the factors that point in one direction, the factors that point in another, uh, yes, his mean, analysis yes. of innocent or other explanation. In a, in the way that the judge frames his finding, in my submission, of paragraphs 125 to 132, he frames his judgment. One way is it were, saying these are the reasons that I find there has been Um, he doesn't, on the face of the judgment, expressly go through a balancing exercise, as it were. But in my submission, paragraphs 125 to 132 are the manifestations of the, judge, of the judge's consideration of all these important points of evidence. And almost by, by definition, if I can put it that way, by definition, if he is finding this point indicates guilt, this point indicates guilt, this point indicates undue influence. By definition, he has discarded 
an alternative explanation, which would be an innocent one. Uh, and as I say, the judge was, is candid in saying we will never know what happened, but it's the cumulative effect of the evidence in this case. Uh, the judge was, the, was there and heard the evidence over a number of days, and um, one would want to act, act cautiously before seeking to overturn his assessment of the evidence. Which is how I would put it. Well, you can go a bit further than that in the light of uh, dicta such as Lord Justice Lewis of Involpe and Volpe. We can only intervene if the finding is rationally insupportable. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and I don't think one can say that the decision in this case is rationally unsupportable. Any judgment can probably be questioned or prodded to some extent, but there is a rational basis for the determination which the uh, learned judge makes. You haven't said anything about a different point that Mr. Deacon made, and maybe because it's not actually a ground of appeal, but even so, the submission has been made, so we need to hear what your answer is. And that is that there's a different procedural unfairness to that which is the subject of ground one, yes. viz that some of the judge's findings are based on points which were not put yes. to Mr. Deacon's witness in cross-examination. Yes. Uh, that is not part of ground one. That is not a point that was before Lord Justice Nugy when he gave permission to appeal. Um, I'm not sure that it features very much in the skeleton. It's certainly not within the ambit of any of the grounds of appeal. And uh, of course, one must not forget that the judge found that we had in the court an untruthful witness. If I had directly put the question to the appellant, did you exert undue pressure over your mother? She would not have answered that question yes in a thousand years because she was not there. The judge found to assist the court and be truthful. She was there to be defensive, uh, not to give uh, a true account of what had happened in relation to this will. I think the judge was very clear that this is huge. But well, that was not a ground of appeal. I do understand your point that this isn't a ground of appeal. On the other hand, uh, I mean, as recently reiterated by the yes. Supreme Court in the Tui case, there is an obligation Yes. To challenge a witness on what they say. Yes. Um, there's an obligation to put your case. Yes. Um, and it isn't normally regarded as good enough that you say, oh, look, um, if I put my case, I'd have got an answer that would have been obviously untruthful. Yes. The more so since a witness might be untruthful about some matters and truthful about other matters. Yes. But one was concerned in cross examination, which the judge picked up on in, in, in the judgment to test the underlying factual building which might lead to a conclusion of undue evidence. Uh, it, it, and and that, 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 you know, the building blocks for undue influence were, were dealt with. I mean, for example, there were questions about the misrepresentation of the appellant's financial circumstances. This was all leading to final submission as to whether the, the evidence justify the finding of undue influence. Uh, I, I believe the appellant was adequately tested in relation to matters which were relevant to undue influence. Uh, and there is no doubt from the judge's findings that he concluded she had failed to persuade the court that the explanations were innocent. I believe that there was sufficient testing in the cross-examination. But apart from that, it was, it was not pleaded as part of the, uh, the case on appeal. Can I just pick up one very specific point? Um, in paragraph 130, the judge expresses concern about the terms of the will. Yes. He says it's a major change. Of course, the very fact that you've had a will for 30 years might mean it's time to change it. Yes. Um, but leave that aside. Then he says the language of clause 11, the final sentence purporting to express Anna's wish, um, 
that should her sons advance any challenge her executors to defend, to defend any claim and so on. Now that is unusual, yeah. but was that ever the subject of any evidence at the hearing? Yes, I believe it was, uh, my lord, it goes back to the point. The evidence was received from family members, amongst others. There were various family members who gave evidence of their recollections of their, their mother and grandmother as a sweet, kind lady. And the judge was simply finding that based on the evidence I have heard about the personality of this uh, mother and grandmother, it is my judicial assessment that she would not of her own volition and free will, have used the language that she did in the will. It was entirely at odds with what the court had received about the nature of, of the deceit. So, so I follow that in general terms, but there are two people who could have said something about that, who gave evidence in the yeah. court. Uh, first of all, in the fact, what you're saying and what the judge seems to have accepted is that uh, the appellant came up with this, and that's why it was in the will. So that should have been put to her. Secondly, the solicitor gave evidence. We haven't seen the attendance note, but obviously there's a detailed attendance note. I don't know if the attendance note says anything about how that wording got into the will, but whether or not it did, she could have been asked about how the wording got into the will. Yeah. So was either of those witnesses asked about it? Uh, the honest answer is I can't remember if that was the case. Uh, I mean, we've got the complete transcript, so we should be able to... Um, um, I would have to look through the transcript and see if there's any. I have no particular recollection. Let's listen. We, we, we have checked it. It's not there. But there, there again, I, 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 I make the point. You say we, I solicit yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would still make the point, my lord, that the judge was assessing what the evidence he had heard about the witness and asking himself rationally, looking at the terms of this will uh, and taking into account the evidence I have received about the nature and character of this witness, is it likely that she would have been behind clause 11 of the will or is it more likely that that was the result of undue pressure being exercised? And I see that in general terms. Can I just pursue the specific point a moment longer? If neither the appellant nor Mrs. Suckle was asked about this, was the judge entitled to attach any weight to it? Yes, I believe he was. Because? Because it's part of the, part of the over, over, overall evidence. I mean, the, the terms of the will are documentary evidence. They're there in black and white, and the judge could read them. Uh, and there was witness evidence in the witness statements and oral evidence about the characteristics of the deceased. And in my submission, the judge was entitled in his judicial function to look at the documentary evidence and to consider the evidence that had been received in relation to the deceased's nature and character and personality and ask himself what was the explanation for the terms in the will. Whether that was raised in examination or cross examination, I believe the judge was entitled to consider that. Can I just check that the, the um, Rita was present at the first meeting with yes. the solicitor, not present at the second meeting with the solicitor? I believe she was present at both meetings. No, no, no not the second. No, not the second. She, she wasn't, because the, the notes confirm that she was absent from the meetings yes. on the 7th. And I take that to be I, the, the, December. the meeting with the solicitor, the second oh. meeting, and the meeting with the doctor. Yes. So we know that the mother's character was such, seemingly, that she could form these adverse views of her sons, yeah. because that's what she said to the solicitor, that's what she said to the doctor, and in circumstances where the appellant wasn't there. Well, that was a possibility. The judge found it wasn't a probability. What found it wasn't a probability that she formed an adverse view of her sons and said so. Where does he say that? Well, I think if one takes 125 to 132, takes all the factors together, the historical fact that the sons were caring for the mother until a few days 
before the rules have changed, all of the other factors that are listed there. Again, he, the judge found it was unlikely that that would have caused the mother to change the will. But if the mother had taken the decision, I want to change my will and cut out all of my sons from the inheritance they've expected for the last 30 years, that it was probable she would have said to them that she was going to do so. Those were his judicial findings based on the evidence. So, so just, um, I know we've been over this ground. We, we suppose, do we, that the mother is less likely to have told the sons about the will if her will had been they were born than she would have been if she'd really been persuaded to cut her sons out of the will. Um, why? Because if this was a genuine change of testamentary and she had a valid historical reason for doing it. For example, her sons had not been in touch with her in many years, something like that. If she had a valid reason to cut them out, then it's more likely, if one takes the judge's approach, that she would have gone to her sons and said, look, I know this will be very distressful to you. I am cutting you out of the will. These are my reasons for doing so. That, on the judge's approach, would have been what what would have reasonably been expected of a sweet, charitable, loving mother. It never suggested that the deceased was not a loving mother till the day she died. What was least likely is that at 86 years of age, she would become scheming and deceptive uh, and take steps which she must have known would have been very hurtful to the sons and have gone to her grave proffering no explanation judge would say that is that is the least likely explanation as to why that will changed so quickly. Where does he say that? Sorry? You're going on about yes. um, this would not be her because of her nature yes. she would have um, told the yes. children. Where, do, where does the judge actually say Let me just, um, He does refer to it at one uh, paragraph one twenty eight. That's in the uh, authorities. Oh, sorry, in the court one two eight page seventy four. Yes, but it's yeah. the point you were making yes. that essentially you were saying, but for uh, Rita's intervention, yes. the mother would have told the sons. Yes, and I, I'm not sure that that's. Yes, it is there. Some is it okay? Well, I suppose at page 133 he refers to uh, cutting out the sons who had stood to share equally in the estate for almost 30 years. Why, why would Rita feel it appropriately appellant to lie about the circumstances? And he goes on to say, why else should Rita have kept quiet? Yes, so he was focusing on Rita yes. as a man, but the keeping quiet was part of his... No, I know, but it's, sorry, I was just... I, d I don't think your submission that the judge found yes. that uh, the deceased would have um, told the sons is actually reflected in the judgment. Because you see, if you look at paragraph 68, when the yes. judge is dealing with um, uh, Miss Batson's evidence, he, he, and he accepted her evidence, at the end of paragraph 68, he, yes. he says that Paula accepted that she was a kind and loving person sorry, kind, loving, and nice person, yes. but she said that she had reacted badly to those sons deciding to give up on her care. And she, Paula, had not been surprised by the terms of Clause 11. Yeah. Um, so that's also balanced by the yeah. judge in his yeah, conclusions. So, and a paragraph 133, the learned judge does make a um, clear finding of improper influence in the cutting out of the sons he does find there was improper influence in relation to that cutting out. I mean, he obviously does. Yeah. In terms of who might have told the sons, there's the appellant yes. 
or there's her mother. Yes. And he was saying a moment ago, I think, well, the mother's character was such that yes. she wasn't likely to yes. fail to tell the son. Well, we know she had testamentary capacity. We know she knew, knew and understood the terms of her will. Yes. So she knew she'd cut her sons out of the will. So yes. why didn't she tell them? Yes. She may have known she was cutting her sons out of the will in the sense of her cognitive facility or ability. But that doesn't exclude the possibility that she made that cognitive decision, not of her own volition, but as a result of influence exerted upon her. But clearly, she knew what she was doing. The question the judge had to answer in my submission is, why was she doing it? She knew she was doing it, but why? And all of the factors added together gave the answer to that question, why? to be that unlaw or illegitimate pressure had been applied to her. Otherwise, although she knew what she was doing, she would not have made that decision. Yeah. The only other uh, uh, point I'd make in relation to ground three, if that's convenient to go to that, uh, ground three, the judge was wrong to have found that the involvement of the solicitor, Mrs. Sickle, did nothing to counteract or dispel the undue influence he found to have been exercised by the appellant. Uh, in my submission, my lords, there was nothing improper in the learned judge's treatment of the evidence of Mrs. Sickle. Mrs. Sickle, in my submission, was an unsatisfactory witness at the trial, in particular because she was extremely defensive as to her involvement in the signing and the execution of the will. Sorry, where's that reflected in the judgment? I'm sorry? Where's that reflected in the judgment? Um, I, I'm coming to a relevant part of the judgment now. Right. Um, core bundle, page 76. That's paragraph 136 of the judgment. This is an aspect in which... Yes, but where does the judge say that, that Mr. Sucker was very defensive? Uh, that, that is my submission. Right. Uh, that is his submission. He does not say that in terms no. of my submission. But she was uh, defensive. Well, I, don't and you, at, I don't think you can make that submission if the judge hasn't addressed it. Um, well, I'll withdraw. The judge ex did the judge not accept her evidence? Well, I, I'll simply write it on paragraph 136 of the judgment. Yes. That's a core bundle, page 76, where he said, the judge says, I quote, neither Mrs. Sapul nor Dr. Kayum took any effective steps to ensure that Anna had been subjected to no undue pressure from Rita and that Anna was left to self-certify that she was making the 2015 will with no undue pressure from anyone. And having found made his find that neither the solicitor nor the doctor took any steps to investigate the undue influence question, really weren't in a position to give evidence about that. Well, to, place to be, no to be fair to them, as my Lord Lord Justice Newey pointed out this morning, if one assumes yes. that there had been prior undue influence, yes. which is the judge's yes. finding, what were they going to do about it anyway? Yes. yes. And I, I, I obviously follow that. But in terms of what, how the judge said he was assessing Mr. He says in paragraph 53, I find her to be a competent solicitor yes. in the field of wills, probate, and the administration yes. of the states and a reliable, honest, and satisfactory witness. Yes. Who in cross-examination declined to speculate about matters of which she had no personal knowledge. I accept her evidence entirely as far as it goes. Yes, yes, that, that was the case. But when it came to undue influence, he found that as a solicitor, she had taken no steps to investigate whether undue influence had or had not been exercised. I think it took no... Well, I'm not sure, yes, I'm not sure it's fair. He actually asked, she asked, she thought she had to get a view from the doctor, didn't she? I'm sorry? I, didn't she refer um, the mother to the doctor? She did for a, for a mental capacity test. You say there, there is no argument or controversy that the deceased knew what she was doing and was, was of sound mind. That is an entirely separate question as to whether there was undue influence. Uh, and really the solicitor, who I think saw the deceased perhaps on one occasion in her office, was really not in a position 
Sorry, to assist the court so with whether the, undue influence had been exerted. Or the deceased saw the solicitor twice. Yeah, one was the uh, signing of the will. Yes, even, even two when, occasions. She, when she went through the will again. Even if we take those two occasions, when the deceased was at the offices of Mrs. Sickle for a brief period of time, uh, it didn't really assist the court in establishing whether there was um, um, undue influence. Um, and uh, if I could just refer to one of the authorities again, authorities bundle page 222, Paragraph 93 of the judgment of Mr. Justice Mann in Schrader and Schrader. Uh, he's quoting, uh, sorry, 122, paragraph 93, quoting Lord Newberger, Master of the Rose in Gill or Jill and Woodall, paragraph 14, where he says, knowing and, quote, knowing and approving of the contents of one's will is traditional language for saying that the will represented one's testamentary intention. See per Lord Justice Chadwick in Fuller and Strum. The proposition that Mrs. Gill knew and approved of the contents of the will appears at first sight, first sight very hard indeed to resist. As a matter of common sense and authority, the fact that a will has been properly executed after being prepared by a solicitor and read over to the testatrix raises a very strong presumption that it represents the testatrix's intentions at the relevant time, namely the moment that she um, executes the will. So although that is a strong presumption in relation to knowledge and approval of the contents of the will, in my submission, it does not bind the hands of a judge in finding that nevertheless there was um, undue influence um, at play. No, but might this not suggest or support or indeed require the judge when deciding whether or not undue influence is proved yes. to have regard to the role, the evidence, yes. the involvement of the solicitor yes. and the doctor. Yes, uh, and I believe, uh, going to what my, my lord, the extract my lord read uh, earlier of the judgment, the judge did give full acknowledgement credit as a word to the solicitor, saying she was competent, professional, no one suggested uh, otherwise. So he did consider the solicitor there, he wasn't ignoring that fact. But on the particular facts of this case, he found that the evidence of the solicitor wasn't conclusive, because she had not taken on the facts any particular steps to inquire into whether undue influence had or had not been present. And indeed, there was no means by which she could have done so probably. She only saw the deceased on, on, on two occasions. As the judge said, the undue influence would have gone on behind closed doors. Neither Mrs. Sickle nor the doctor would really have been able to assist greatly on this. Uh, and the mere fact that a solicitor is present doesn't uh, disengage, let me put it that way, the undue influence. Uh, we say that um, what weight was to be afforded to the evidence of the solicitor in making findings on the issue of undue influence was a matter for the judge, we say, having heard the solicitor gave her evidence. There was nothing irrational, irregular, or unjust in the decisions that um, he came to. And uh, unless I can assist on the... Um, Three grounds of appeal. Um, I, I would just, in closing, um, say to the court, or to the court, it's now eight years since uh, Anna Ray was deceased. There have been a plethora of hearings, including two trials, to determine which of the two wills should be admitted to probate. I, I referred the court to the comments made by the Lord Justices when this matter was last before the Court of Appeal. Uh, the respondent's position, in summary, is the retrial having taken place. The court having pronounced its judgment on that ordered retrial, the time has come to be closed on this litigation uh, and for the detailed and careful judgment of his honour Judge Hodge uh, to be recognised uh, on the actual testamentary intent of the late Anna Ray. And unless I can assist further, those would be the submissions. No, thank you very much. Yes.
Two very short points, Lord. Um, dealing first with the cross-examination points, could I take you to the core bundle at page 89? Yes. This is the respondent skeleton at paragraph 50. This is why the cross-examination point was raised. What's said at paragraph 50 in the respondent skeleton on the appeal is that paragraph 13 of the defence and counterclaim, and I emphasise not paragraph 14, in this case provided a sufficient basis for the respondent's case on undue influence and identified several key elements underpinning the case on undue influence. The appellant can have been in no doubt at trial as to the case she was facing on undue influence and had every opportunity to rebut that case in her oral evidence. Well, the way this works, of course, like any trial, is that the witness statements are based on the issues raised in the pleadings. And that's what uh, the appellant's witness statement dealt with. If there are other matters that are going to be relied on, they, the, the appellant, the witness, can only have an opportunity to deal with them if they're put in cross-examination. You see, what, Malone, what the respondent skeleton goes on to say at 51, her failure to do so and the findings of the court she gave false tenery false testimony as was a witness who lacked candor should not be obfuscated by, obfuscated by an ex post facto attack on the pleadings. But her failure to deal with these points, which had not been raised in the pleadings and therefore not dealt within the witness statement, would, would only arise from cross-examination if they're not matters that have been raised as issues. Yes. And that's why I went through what, what was actually put in cross-examination to test that, 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 that submission that was made on behalf of the respondents. But, but that also, of course, goes to the pleading point. But, but as I say, I, it, it, that has to be taken into account. The only other point that I've made if I can move on, is to go to the authorities bundle at page 104. Which is back to Lord Millet's um, opinion in Green yes. Rivers. At, at, at A to B, it's actually, uh, if I can just read the middle of A to B, because it's the last sentence which I refer to. At trial, the court would normally, not normally allow proof of primary facts which have not been pleaded, and will not do so in the case of fraud. It's not open to the court to infer dishonesty from facts which have not been pleaded, or from facts which have been pleaded but are consistent with honesty. And it's this that I rely on. There must be some fact which tilts the balance and justifies an inference of dishonesty. And he says this must be both pleaded and proved. So, in coming back to the point about the rope, the, the, the way and the strands of the rope, which is perfectly understandable, and, and it, that, that is how it works, but what I would submit Lord Millet there is saying that you've got to look at it and you've got to identify that fact that turns it into. You can't just go through a lot, a lot of innocuous facts and then say, listen, I've got all these facts and I think, I think they sort of prove dis dishonesty and then come to the, the finding of dishonesty. There's got to be something more than that that tilts it over. And 
And it's, it's marrying that with this question of being inconsistent with an innocent explanation, an innocent hypothesis. And I would emphasize that this is not an ordinary case of pleading. This is a case under CPR 57.74 where there is a mandatory requirement, like a fraud case, that you have to plead particulars of undue influence, of probate undue influence. Um, and in the Schomburg case, and I can take you to it, but there is an, an example of a pleading of undue due influence. And it is very extensive. If I can, perhaps, yes. if I can take you to it. Um, page 149 and then you go to page 154 yes so paragraph 28 sets out in detail what was pleaded in the shop Schomburg case by way of, of the particulars for undue influence. So it said in paragraph 28, David and Paul's case for undue influence is set out paragraphs 33 to 43 of their defence. I will read out the relevant paragraphs. And then they're set out in detail. And if one goes over, for example, I've just taken an example on page 155, paragraph 41. Further, following the death of Brian Taylor, the deceased was in the period between the death of the husband and the execution of the 2008 will physically and emotionally very frail, indicating on occasion she no longer saw any purpose continu continuing to live. And it's this bit. She was accordingly particularly susceptible to pressure in this period, unable to cope with the pressure applied to her by the eighth defendant, as set out below. Between the date of death of Brian Taylor on the 18th of October 2008 and the date of the execution of the 2008 will, eight will the eighth defendant unduly influenced the deceased to make the will in which his children were the principal beneficiaries. He did so by, and then 42.1 it said, repeatedly telephoning the deceased in order to persuade her to make substantial revision. 42.2, persisting in the said course of conduct, notwithstanding her fragile mental state, evident vulnerability. 42.3, procuring the second defendant was a former family solicitor um, in her divorce as present when the first payment attended the deceased house in order to take instructions. <coughs> and then at 43, the deceased complained to the first defendant and third defendant during the period between the death of Brian Taylor and the execution of the will that 43.1, she did not, <coughs> did not know what to do about the will. 43.2, that the eighth defendant had been telephoning her and pressuring her to make provision for his children in her will and that she believes he was in financial difficulty, etc. Well, I mean, that's, that's the end of it. But the, the point I make is that there's got to be particulars that tilt the balance, that you look at those and you can see the inconsistency. And very little is pleaded. There is vulnerability is pleaded, but there's no finding of vulnerability in this case. Well, that depends on what you mean by vulnerability. I mean, I think the judge was using it in a non-technical sense when he made the finding that he did. But you're no. absolutely right. There's nothing in terms of medical condition that's identical. Yes. Well, I, I, I've got to confess, I didn't raise... The, the, I mean, I didn't question that um, in the court below. But, um, but, but there's hardly anything that's pleaded to base... The, uh, the claim of undue influence on. I mean, there are a number of other matters, unless I can assist further. I... What other? Sorry. No, I was going to say, I mean, it, it, those would be my suggestions. Okay. I think someone's trying to yes, get if I your may, attention. May I just take yes. it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I 
I mean, I, my client wants to make the point that she's saying this was the first time she knew of the allegations that were made against her. But um, could I just make this point? I think it's at page 583 in the transcript. In the transcript. 583. Yes. B This was the um, this is the application to strike out point. Could could I just <coughs> take you through to the, the bottom of that. Um, Honour Judge Hodge um, said, well, I strongly suspect that any application to strike out would have been unsuccessful, given the history. And I said, yes, I agree. Would, be likely to, would have been likely to take your view of this matter, just must proceed to trial. And then I said, exactly. Yes. I said, well, I understand that. And then Honour Judge Hodge I remember from years ago there was a case where at trial an application was made out, was made to strike out for summary judgment and that was successful. The Court of Appeal said you shouldn't do that, you should just hear the evidence because otherwise you have an appeal and then you have a retrial and it would have been even worse here where there had already been one trial. Yes. I mean that sort of encapsulates the way that, that, that we were looking at it. I mean, uh, I can't really take that any further. That's no, the way we look at it, and that's the decision that, that was uh, made. With regard to the opening, it was a, it was my learning friend actually who won. I don't think we need to go back. To that. No, and we have no further questions. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, thank you both very much for your comprehensive submissions. We are reserving our judgment. They will be provided to you in draft in the usual way, and I think it's important given the context of this case, that it is understood that they're provided in draft only to correct our typographical mistakes, not to seek to re-argue, raise uh, any legal question or other question about the content of the judgment. Um, and we would hope once you've received the judgments in draft, and also it, they'll contain the notice that they can only be used for limited purposes, and it's a contempt of court for them to be used for any other purpose. We would hope that once you've got them, you'll be able to agree and order, but if not, we'll deal with any outstanding matters on paper. Thank you. Great. So again, thank you all very much. Thank you. All. Oh, uh, my lord, I'm just being